Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. Welcome back to Wireless Land Weekly. This is Keith Parsons. I'm your host for this episode today. And like last week, episode 22, uh, this is going to kind of be a, a solo event. Uh, we have a bunch of other uh, people uh, scheduled to come on board and do some new things, some interview again, some more online interviews. I've just been a little bit busy and out of the office and away from the equipment that allows for those. So uh, this week's going to be on learning wireless LAN technologies. So sit back, listen up, and we're going to be uh, covering how to learn well, for the last 15 years of my life, I've been an instructor of uh, wireless technologies. Uh, yeah, I do a little bit of consulting work on the side. Anywhere from 20 to 40% of my time I spend uh, helping others to design, troubleshoot, and maintain their wireless networks. But basically, for more than half of my time for the last decade or so, I've been a teacher. Well, the last decade, I've been a teacher of just wireless lens. Prior to that, I started out actually doing uh, Novell with the Novell CNA, then onto the CNE. I got my instructor as a CNI, a master CNE, and then a master CNI, and I started writing courses and exams, etc. And then after that, we started into the Microsoft track and went through MCP, MCSE, MCT, MCSE plus I. Again, I'm a collector of TLAs, three-letter acronyms. Uh, actually a collector of FLAs too. Some of these are four letter acronyms. And then I went through the entire CompTIA series, A plus, Security plus, Network plus, Server plus, Linux plus, you know, the whole series there. And of course, you know, how could you be in the networking industry without the Cisco? And I got CCNA, CCDA, NP and DP and did uh, training on all of these, uh, over years and years. But then about 10 years ago, I decided to focus. I wanted to get a little, you know, niche because you, you didn't want to compete with everyone else and got into wireless networking. And for the last 10 years, I've been just teaching wireless networking alone. Um, teaching CWNA, CWSP, I used to teach the CWAP, um, and help prep some people for the CWNE exam as well. And of course, you have to follow along with the Cisco side, and I got Cisco CC NA wireless. So the reason I was telling you all that just one wasn't to say, yeah, I've got lots and lots of certs, and I do have lots of certs, but that's because I like to collect them. You guys are out there actually doing the work every day. I'm just working on the certification side. And the reason I mention this isn't about my education. It's just so you know that I have lots of experience in studying, prepping, taking exams, learning new things, especially in networking technology. So today's podcast is on learning wireless LAN technologies, and I want you to know that I've done it. So I've been there before, and I spend the majority of my time during my waking hours helping other people to learn these technologies too. So this episode is on how we can take what I've learned, and I want to share with you so and help you, you learn as well. Well, the first is something called learning styles. And in learning styles, this is some you know, academic type folks have went along and said, well, some people learn by doing, some people learn by listening, some people learn by visual, uh, some do learn by doing. There's a bunch of different styles. And, and in the show notes, I left a link there where you can go take an inventory and find out what kind of a learner are you. Usually it's pretty easy and you could just listen to your own vocabulary. And when you talk to others, is it more based on what you you want them to show you something or do you want to hear it or see it? Or let me see it or let me hear it. And you can even hear that yourselves. I know with my wife when she is, you know, giving me this big list of things that she wants me to do, I go, just write it down. If I can see it, I can do it. If you say it and it goes in my ear, it just disappears. I have to, for me personally, stuff has to come in my eyes in order for it to stick. So I'm obviously a very visual learner and that's how I do stuff. So one method of learning has to do with that style, and you need to find your style. And then a lot of the learning technologies and techniques are focused on a certain learning style. And if that style isn't matching yours, then find another option. We have lots of options in the training world, so make sure you find one that matches you. Years ago, I was involved in the writing of certification exams, a whole series of exams for... I've developed seven different certification programs for a variety of of vendors, IBM, VeriSign, uh, Novell, Microsoft, et cetera. And in that process, we came across this uh, 
thing called Bloom's Taxonomy. Big fancy name. I'm sure you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy where you know basic needs are at the bottom, at the top is self-actualization. Well, in Bloom's Taxonomy, he talks about the different types of things we might want to learn. Some things we need to learn are just straight rote memorization. And that's the very bottom of his pyramid. And in the show notes, there's a, a link to a picture. You can blow it up and kind of follow along and look in the Bloom's Taxonomy pyramid or hierarchy. As you're looking at different goals, uh, there's different ways to learn to reach those goals. Now, for a certification exam, we had to go and interview people who did the job, who were out every day working in that field doing that job, and find out what types of work were you doing in order to accomplish the task. And then for those tasks, what did you need to know? And then we took what they talked about what they needed to know and backed into Bloom's taxonomy to find out how difficult those things were and did it need more than rote knowledge? Did it need actual synthesis, knowledge from three or four different places and to synthesize those together? And then that would tell us how to write the course and the test questions that could test that. Well, you need to know as you start studying, is the topic you're studying at the top of Bloom's taxonomy? Is it something where you need to do full evaluation or just synthesis? Or is it straight up, I just need to know the command to you know open up a print queue? Well, that's something you can memorize. So you need to think yourself as you go about looking into these, which one and where does your learning need to be? So first, find out what's your learning style. Do you learn visually or via auditory or physical? I had a um, guy who worked with me for a while. His daughter learned math by doing. She had to stand and walk around the classroom and touch three or seven or move physical things, and then she could remember. Uh, Others need to hear, and you need someone to talk to you about it or listen over and over, and so audio tapes might be good for other people. Another thing to think about during your learning style is when is your best time to study? Not just when, but where is your best time to study? Do you have a study area where you can go and sit and be quiet? Uh, Do you need to have music playing in the background? What kind of music? Does it need to be like Mozart that is found to be very helpful for learning math? Or are you a rocker and want to listen to rock to distract that part of your brain so you could focus on another part of your brain? And you need to get permission to learn. Not just permission from your spouse to take the time off and convince her why the, or him, depending on who you are, your spouse why you need to have the time alone to study and how it's going to help your career, etc. But you need to get permission from your boss for the time off and specifically permission from yourself that you're giving yourself permission to focus. And learning is all about focus. What am I going to do for the next period of time? How am I going to learn? And do I have permission myself to ignore other things that might need to get done because learnings become a priority? So setting a priority is very helpful. I had a partner once, a great guy, uh, loved him. He's uh, now moved on to other things and we're still good friends. But he, uh, at the time we were tr- doing a bunch of training. In fact, at the time we were training people who were, uh, because of NAFTA came and was approved, a very large um, steel mill was closed down, and so we were retraining steel mill workers to get their A+, plus, the Network+, plus, their Server+, plus, CNE from Novell, and a MCSC from Microsoft, and a CCA from Cisco, all in this big, long, you know, four-month chunk of time. They would receive seven different certifications. So it was a pretty cool thing we were working. And then on one of the occasions, I was working with this partner, and I... I asked him to go study something so he could go and you know teach that next level course, and he said, "Well, you know, I can't do it. I haven't done it yet." And then, you know, we got a little tiff uh, a bit about, "Why well, don't you just go read it? Go, you know, read up so you know it." And he said, "I only learn by things I've done." And then I made up this real pithy statement. At the time, it sounded kind of silly. But over the years, it's actually become uh, kind of part of what, how I teach and teach other people. And the pithy statement was, if you only learn by doing, then you'll only ever know what you've done. Well, of course, that's obvious. But then when you think about it, those people who learn by doing only are limited to just the things that they've done. If they've never done it, they don't know how to do it at all. Well, there's a lot of learning that takes place on things you don't actually have to do, but you can still learn them. Now, 
as we go down in some of our learning options in the next following section, we're going to talk about some of the options and, you know, self-study and hands-on are some of the options. But there are other things you also have to uh, learn and do and some things that are conceptual, like the OSI model. It's kind of hard to do the OSI model, and yet it's critical in our networking world that you not only understand that, um, but you can use it a different way. So if you wanted to go and look at the uh, graphic that's on the show notes for Bloom's Taxonomy, at the very bottom level is knowledge, just straight rote memorization. Well, the first time I went about learning the OSI model, it was definitely at the knowledge level, the very base level, uh, memorized all people seem to need data processing or please do not throw sausage pizza away. And I could regurgitate each of the names of the layers. But I really didn't understand what they did. Well, to understand is the next level up called comprehension. And not only do you have rote memorization, but you understand what each of those do. And I slowly learned that. And later, probably a year or two after I first learned about the OSI model, I moved up Bloom's taxonomy to something called application where I could apply that knowledge. Oh, I need to put a bridge in here because a bridge is going to break up a collision domain because at the physical layer these things are happening and the bridge is going to use Mac layer definitions to make the changes. Oh, okay, so I'm now applying it. Then if you climb even higher, then you can use the knowledge about just the OSI model, not knowledge, not comprehension and application, but now we're going to do some analysis. Thinking about how things work because of there. And a lot of the OSI model's effectiveness happens when you get into troubleshooting. That's analysis of the data. Again, climbing up Bloom's taxonomy. And eventually you want to get to something where there's synthesis. And in the wireless LAN technologies, you need to know the OSI model at the synthesis level. Not just at the knowledge or comprehension or even application, but we're synthesizing and, and merging two separate groups from the wireless side, 802.11, and we're translating that into the Ethernet side, 802.3. And we need to be able to synthesize the information from one side and apply it to the other. So Bloom's Taxonomy, look back at what you're doing. From the simplest little OSI model, you can also use it to climb from knowledge all the way up to synthesis to evaluation. Let's move on now to some learning options. And the first learning option I'm going to go with is instructor-led training. I like instructor-led training. I like attending instructor-led training. I like giving instructor-led training. I think it's the most effective, efficient use of everyone's time if the goal is to take someone and to give them knowledge and have them able to use that knowledge in the future. Now, the reason I like it, um, one, it's my career, so I'm, you know, a little coin operated there and obviously I get paid for doing that so I kind of like doing it but as a student and I try to spend at least two and usually three weeks a year in my own training for myself and I attend other people's classes and I would much rather attend an instructor led class because when I sit in the class I'm focused I got on a plane I flew I'm in a hotel room I wake up in the morning and today's job is learning that's all I have to do today. I'm not answering phones. I'm not answering emails. I am learning today. And as an instructor, I would really appreciate it if when students come to class, they come with that attitude. You are here to learn today. Now, I have, and I admit I'm one of those. Sometimes I'll sit in class with my computer open and on the Internet, and as the instructor mentions something, there is a fantastic capability that as an instructor says something that triggers something in your mind and to be able to link some knowledge you already have to the knowledge that you just learned is a good way to learn and, and remember things. That linkage is good. One of the effects that you can have in class with a laptop open is as the instructor says something that triggers something in your head or another question, you can go directly to Google and ask and learn more. And all of a sudden there's a whole wealth of information out there available in Google the problem is, as you're Googling, the instructor is continuing on down his path, teaching the next concept, and you are missing that concept. Something I found that helps a lot in this process, well, one of two things, either the use of Evernote. Evernote's a piece of software. It runs on Windows, Mac, um, probably runs on DOS even, but anything you're probably using. Uh, and it's a little plug-in for Firefox or Internet Explorer or Chrome 
where you go to that web page, you Googled it, you saw, you know, this is really good information. It links back into what we just covered in class. And you click Evernote and say, save it. And it will save that file over into your notebook. And then you can return your attention back to what the instructor is and stay together. But now you have not just a mere bookmark, but it copied all of the files for you into a searchable notebook for you called Evernote. The other one I use a lot is called Instapaper. I have an iPhone and an iPad, and if I hit a web page that I want to remember and I don't have time right then to go out and jump to it, click on a Read Later button that's on my uh, browser, and there I go. It's all saved into Instapaper. Later, when I sync up my iPad, all of those things that I could have learned live at the moment but were distracting are sitting back in my Instapaper, and later that night I can go back through them and learn. So having an ability to do those extra little searches during the middle of a discussion is a fantastic opportunity. What's not so fantastic is one click away, you have Facebook and Twitter and a just a regular web page and CNN and it's the middle of the and season that we're recording this right now. We're in the middle of the World Cup and someone just you know posted a new World Cup score and you got to go look at it. And all of those things take time and you focus away from what you're learning in class. So I like instructor-led classes. I love instructor-led classes. I like attending them. I like teaching them. But focus on what you're doing. Focus is really important. Instructor-led classes cost more money. They cost more money for the reason that they're better. They're better at delivering knowledge and getting it in your head and making it stick because of the focus. It's not just because you have an instructor sitting in front of the room. Now, I like having an instructor there that's teaching and is more knowledgeable on the subject than I am, but I also like the fact that I have nothing else to do that day. My job that day is to learn. In fact, that night, I don't have to go home and worry about mowing the lawn or playing with the children or giving the kids a bath. My job at night is to continue to learn. One of my frustrating parts is about on you know the day after uh, I've taught a, a you know a nice session. The next morning I come in, and some of the students ask questions about what they studied at night that they were trying to reinforce what they learned the day before, and they have brilliant questions that I could tell that they needed to synthesize the data way up the Bloom's taxonomy. Others come back and talk about the baseball game they went to because they're hey it's on a lark. My company paid me to come here, and we went to dinner. We went out to a show. We went drinking. Wait, your job is to study. And for those of you who like to think that your job is over at 5 o'clock, when when you're doing instructor-led training, it's not. You're there to study, study into the night until you can not study anymore and then fall asleep and do it again the next day. So for certification training, I think instructor-led is the only way to go. It allows you to focus, focus, focus. You go to a boot camp, and at the end, you can go and take and pass the test. Just a hint on the side, if you're taking a boot camp, please, please take the test the day after the class or the afternoon of the last day if you can. The knowledge in your head will never be better than right then. You've just spent 40 to 60 hours that week focusing on a subject. You're going to go home and say, oh, I'll study one more week. I'm just not ready yet. Well, if you're not ready yet, take the test anyway. One, you're, you're, you've got as much knowledge in your head as you're going to get. You've had 40 to 60 hours of focused effort on that one topic. Take the test. If you fail, you now have learned more. You learned what you didn't know. A lot of students still go, I don't want to waste that, the voucher and I want to pay for the test again. So they go home and they have home responsibilities and the wife and the children and the work kits back in and they slowly – May, over weeks or even months, or had some people over a year, it takes to pass the exam because they have to go back and they lost all the focus. So if you really want to pass the cert, dedicate. Put the focus in. It's no distractions that really helps. So does instructor-led work for you? Uh, if so, why? And think through it. In the classes you've taken so far, where did you have the best knowledge? And by the way, if you're thinking back to your college days, um, for a while, I, I've i been an adjunct professor at a couple uh, universities teaching some of their courses. And from an instructor's standpoint, teaching at a university is a breeze. You only have to teach 
an hour and a half a day, two days, maybe three days a week. That's nothing. And if you think about it, and I have, uh, we actually showed this, taking one week's course, uh, say a CCNA course, is equal to one semester's class. So when you just dedicate one week of your life, you get as much learning as you would have got over an entire semester of any one individual course. So, instructor training, good stuff. Next one on is self-study. Again, I've done lots and lots of self-study. Uh, I was just looking up on the bookshelf on my wall here, and there's probably four, yeah, there's four shelves of nothing but wireless books. That's a lot of learning. I mean, I'm, there are about three feet. Say there's uh, 10, maybe 12 linear feet of books of wireless LAN information. That, plus the networking, all the other books are in the room as well. There is a lot to do in self-study. There's books, CBTs, white papers, audio tracks. I really like books. I'm addicted to books. I buy them all the time. If there's just one chapter in a book that I'll learn something I didn't know before, it's worth picking up the book. Lately, however, I've been trying to get away from paper books. One, they're really hard, heavy. They're hard to carry back to and from areas. I started out with the Kindle, and I went to Kindle DX, trying to find a really good ebook slash PDF reader. Uh, I've now settled on an iPad, and I really like using a tool called software called Good Reader on an iPad. Um, for the one reason, I have hundreds of tech pubs available to me that are searchable, easy to read, and I can even zoom in on the graphics and work on them. I couldn't do that with a Kindle quite well. The iPad works fantastic for that. I try to buy my books in EPUB format, like a Kindle format or actually the format called EPUB that is, uh, Apple uses. If I can't get that, I'll go to a PDF. Not PDFs aren't always as searchable as an EPUB format, but I'll take a PDF and I can zoom in. And the last resort would be to buy a paper copy. I really like having hundreds of books and technology knowledge sitting right there in my hand. So can't talk about that enough. Remember, to be a good student, even in self-study, you've got to ask a lot of questions. Now, there's no instructor in the room to answer it, but there's always Twitter. You can go and drop out a question on Twitter, and you'll probably get an answer within minutes. Uh, there's, especially for wireless networking, you can go to the CWNP site, and the CWNP uh, forums are available. You can pop questions up there. Cisco has forums for those uh, of you who are working in Cisco world. So ask questions. And sometimes you have a question you just want to answer. Google the question itself, and you'll find amazing answers. Not that Wikipedia is always perfect, but there's a lot you can learn a lot from the Wikipedia articles that are out there. So self study, nothing wrong with it. It's a lot cheaper, but again, you still have to focus. And I have in the past rented a hotel room, taken my books and my hands-on equipment that I'm going to study on, and pretended that I was in a instructor-led class with no instructor in the room. But you need that focus where there's no other distractions coming along. The next one I'm going to talk about uh, shortly, and it's not very long for me because I'm kind of not into it, is group study. Now, some people are social learners. They need to have other people around them to bounce ideas off of, to have a little interaction. And this kind of person, if this is you, nothing wrong with it. It's just not me. But they like to process the information before they assimilate the information. In my MBA classes, we were assigned into study groups because, you know, well, some of the organizational behavior folks in our MBA program thought groups are better. I'm not one of those. I think they're kind of a waste of time. It's like trying to manage through a committee. Everyone is weaker than any individual themselves. That little example where you take you know, one pencil, anybody can break it, but you put 20 pencils together, you can't break them as a group. Yeah, it's not a log. It's 20 individual pencils, and as long as they do their own job, wonderful. If, however, I don't mean to mean this, sorry. If you are one of those learners who learn socially, then make sure you get in social environments for learning. Set up study groups for CCNA or CCNP, CWNA, CWSP, whatever study group you like. They can be online. They can be live. They can have weekly calls. Uh, you, if you need that assimilation, the interaction to, to be able to get that information in your head and stick, then form those little communities around making that happen. You can go again onto the CWNP forums or Cisco's forums and have that interaction there or just call around and get other people. Um, I'd recommend if you have that kind of need, get on Twitter 
And uh, on Wednesdays, they have something called a wireless Wednesday and just or search for a hash shine, the little pound wireless Wednesday, and you find lots of links. Or you can go to the Wireless Land Professionals website, the website where you're listening to this podcast. On the resource tab, there's a list of all the Twitter people I like to follow in the wireless industry. And there's a group there you can work with. So get together. If you do need that as well, and I've had this a lot of times in my classes, there might be 15, 20 people in the class and four or five of them get together after class at night and form a little study group to focus on what we covered during the day. It's been very effective for them. So if you like to study that way, group study is a good way to go. Next one is hands-on. And this is kind of a subset of all the others. You can do hands-on group study, I guess. Never tried it. But definitely for self-study hands-on, hands-on instructor-led, great stuff. A lot of IT folks, myself included, learn best through working through an interface. We kind of learn by trying and failing and trying and failing. Um, Someone once said to me that as adults, we learn through failure yeah, which is kind of why I'm glad that we learned to drive before we got to be adults. But we do have this failure thing where we try it, and if it fails, we move on. We learn from our failures. In the interface world of IT, you jump into a screen, you click, you go, oh, it's not there. Well, you know, you probably didn't think of that as a failure, but it was. You didn't succeed in the little thing you attempted, so you try something else to get there. I think it's a, it's a way we learn. Accept that. And try stuff without any fear. One of the the problems we run across with some students who come into class is they're afraid of hurting the equipment or making a problem. And so a lot of the techniques are you just have them do it and then reset and do it again and reset and do it again and realize whatever they do, worst case scenario, just reset it and set it back. Uh, Very few things in IT can be broken permanently. Now, yeah, I, I know there are some, but for the most part, we can go away with this. So... Hands-on, you've got to learn do stuff with hands-on. But one caveat on the whole hands-on thing. Many times when I teach or consult, I have people who have learned you know, Cisco or WLCs or even the Ruby controller through a, 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 you know, that failure issue. They get into the screen, they try, they do good and they try, and they've come across and they've got into wireless because they learn hands-on only. They didn't understand the base understanding of how Ada Tovlin works. And thus, when they go back to troubleshoot, many of their problems they're trying to fix, the problems are there because, and specifically, because they didn't understand the base technology that's sitting underneath 802.11. 802.11 is not Ethernet. It's like Ethernet, but there's a lot of things that are totally different. Many of the things are counterintuitive, and a couple of weeks ago I had a podcast on some of the counterintuitive pieces. So I recommend understanding and having a base knowledge of the technology before you implement. Interfaces are really easy to work on. So in the, in the show notes, I put a little thing that says, set rent equal on. One of my biggest pet peeves in the classroom is when people have to get to the interface. And they have questions about how to do things in specific pieces of software, but they refuse to learn why you should be in their face at all. Learn the concepts first, and the interface will be so much easier to understand. Set rant equal off. Well, that was my little rant, but it's true. Don't worry about where you are in the screen or how you got to this one page or any of that. What you want to do is know why you're on that screen. What is it saying on the screen, not how the little clicky parts go? Anyone can learn the interface. That's what user guides are for. And by the way, you kind of ought to read the user guides. Hands-on's great, but understand the technology underneath. And the last one we're going to talk about training options is online training. And online training, um, well, first, learn how to be a good online training student. Prepare your online interface before class. Test it, retest it, make sure your connections are up, your headset's working, all the parts are in place so that 9 a.m. on the morning of class, you're not the one calling in and going, I can't see your screen. You're not moving to the left. And you're like, well, did you run through the interface yet? Well, it's still downloading. Get it done and out of the way first. You don't want to be that guy. Use a headphone and a good mic. Uh, Personally, I like using either Bose noise canceling headphones or I use Dr. Dre Beats headphones, something that can go over the ear and basically drown everything out so I can focus, again, 
do you see a, a consistent theme here? Focus. Learning is a matter of focus. And for online training, ask lots of questions. More questions than you would probably would ask in a live class. Open your mouth, open the keyboard, raise your hand in the online system and ask a lot of questions. One of the issues with online training and why personally I, I, not, I don't have that much experience in it because it doesn't work for me is that you are one click away from doing something you'd like to do. Facebook, Twitter, uh, email, answering something, just surfing the net, finding the news scores. They were one click away. And you're in the middle of an online class, and that temptation is huge to go do anything else. Some online classes are long, four, six, eight hours in a day. And so people put a speakerphone on, and they kind of wander around the room, and they end up working or reading. That's not focus. It is hard to learn. It is even harder to learn in online because you have to focus on what you're doing. Try to be nice to your neighbors. They're also trying to learn. Know how to mute your phone so that your little background noise doesn't happen. Don't put music in the background. It's harder as an instructor to teach online training than face-to-face instructor-led. By far. Way, way harder. There's a lack of feedback. It's tough to maintain student attention. You feel like you're, you know, trying to keep everyone from that one click away and you stay fast and you don't have the time to allow it to, to sink in. And a lot of times you just need some time to assimilate the information and, and then hear it a different way. So when you're doing online training, try to study anywhere but your office desk. At your office desk, you have distractions. When you're in class, even online class, you are not working. This is learning time. Learning time means you're focused on that one task at hand and you're not answering calls, you're not answering emails, you're not doing any of those other things. Priorities, folks. Get your priorities straight. If you don't want the online class, don't sign up for it. Don't attend. But if you do want it, then you've made a decision and someone's made the decision at least and they're paying money for your time and the cost of the class. Focus, focus, focus. Okay, that's enough on all the online training and the self-study training and hands-on training and all those pieces. I just give you some options there, something to think about in your own world. Now, in this last section, we're going to talk a little bit about certification options. Well, the first is there's different goals depending on who you're trying to certify with. There are vendor-neutral certifications and there are vendor certifications. And having worked for both vendor-neutral and vendor-based certifications on both sides of the equation, both in course development and exam development, they have different goals. And make sure the goals of the certification program you're after match your personal goals. If you're working for a Cisco Gold reseller and they tell you we need to have a wireless CCMP on staff to get, uh, you know, however many points off we get as a gold partner, and that's you, well, that's a different goal than do you really not understand all information. You're there to get the cert because your reseller status depends on it. That's different than saying, oh, I'd like to learn how security systems work. Two different goals. Make sure you match the goals to the certification program. The first one we'll talk about vendor neutral certification. The big one in our industry, in the wireless LAN industry, is CWNP. They used to go by the name Planet 3 Wireless. They now just go by CWNP out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, And they have a whole series of different courses that are available for you. CWTS, entry level, basically vocabulary targeted at technical or sales oriented. It's kind of sitting underneath the CWNA. Um, But being there, it's useful. It's a nice preface or prep for the CWNA if you want that extra cert. If that's the only cert you're shooting for in wireless, that's not technical enough. It doesn't really cover how wireless works. It's more talking about the industry, etc. If you're a technical salesperson, you're selling wireless, this would be a fantastic one to start on. Uh, The next level up is CWNA, Certified Wireless Network Administrator. It covers base level concepts. It's generic hands-on experience. You can pass the test without doing any hands-on at all, but most instructor-led course versions, when you attend the class, they do have hands-on to help reinforce the knowledge. It has very good in-depth knowledge on certain parts of Wi-Fi, how Wi-Fi itself works. Strongly, strongly, I'll say it one more time, Strongly, strongly, recommend that you get a CWNA. If you're in this industry, you're doing wireless, okay, I really don't care if you pass the test. Sorry, CWNP program. I don't care if you pass the test, 
but you need to have that level of base knowledge if you're working on wireless LANs. I can't even imagine someone working on Cisco routers and switches and not having the knowledge of how CCNA works, not being able to do subnet mass, not being able to understand iOS commands, not being able to understand how routing protocols work. I don't even know how you could ever do that job. And yet when we get over to the wireless world, so many people have no base understanding of how wireless LANs work. The CWNA will give you that base level understanding. Then the next three, CWSP for security professional, CWAP for packet level analysis, CWDP for design, are all three kind of at the same level, but focused on different pieces. They're all in-depth knowledge, One's on security, one's on analysis, and one's on design. Of course, I would recommend you get all three of them, uh, but you can focus on the one that you're after. I like the CWAP because it's how the protocol does its work. Detailed one packet at a time. So big support there for the CWMP program. CWDP is a new exam. Haven't seen the exam yet. Won't be coming out until the fall. It's on design. But I know the guy's working on it, and they definitely know what they're doing. And the CWSP has been around a long time and just revved lately um, on wireless security. If your security is a big chunk of what you do wirelessly, CWSP is the in-depth side side of that. And then the final one for the CWMP program is called CWNE, Certified Wireless Network Expert. I like this one. Well, I am CWNE number three, so I've been at it for a while. And on their... uh, Certification Roundtable Committee that works with this uh, CWNE. I've helped a lot of people get to the knowledge level so you can pass the test and have recommended them. So if you'd like a recommendation, let me know. Send a, uh, you know, to feedback at wirelesslands, wirelesslandprofessionals.com and we can have a discussion and I can help you head that direction if you want to go that way. It is a written exam, plus you need to have practical experience, a couple of years experience, and work on some projects to qualify for this pinnacle level uh, vendor neutral wireless called CWNE. And our last little section here is on the vendor certifications. We have Cisco, Cisco CCNA Wireless. You have to have a Cisco CCNA to begin with. On top of that, you can get their wireless kind of add-on. Uh, it's not a, You have to have the Cisco CCNA first, and then you just add this on. It covers, uh, you know, I've taught this class. It's a pretty decent class. Um, the tests very, very uh, Cisco centric. A very small section of the course is on Wi Fi technology, and the bulk of the class is all around how Cisco's solution works and which parts do what and how the parts work together. And do you understand the interface of the parts and how the interface works? It's very Cisco centric. If that is your job, this is a great certification. It's showing, yes, I do know the Cisco wireless LAN solution, and I know how to install. Install it, and I can answer questions on it. Um, this CCNA wireless is very low on Bloom's taxonomy. It's you need to have a lot of knowledge, and you need to have some understanding of how the knowledge works, but not much application. Uh, definitely not synthesis. It's very low. If you want to climb up Bloom's taxonomy with, uh, within Cisco, they have the Cisco CCNP wireless. More detailed understanding of Wi-Fi, but even more emphasis on the Cisco solution. But you now need to understand the Cisco solution and how it works and how to implement it. And the final one, the Cisco track, is CCIE Wireless. Uh, It is a two-part certification. One part's a written exam, and there's lots of people who have passed that written exam. Uh, The other side is the practical exam. Very, very difficult. You have to not only understand what you're doing, but be very fast at it. Uh, We did a previous podcast where we went through and talked with Jennifer about how she's gone over and prepped and got ready for the exam. You can look back in the archives and find that if you're interested in the CCIE. There are other vendors. Air Magnet has some uh, certification classes. Uh, They're basically you attend class and if you sit through class and answer some pretty quick questions, you can get certified. Air Defense, OmniPeak, Aerohive, Wireshark, uh, both courses and uh, certifications, depending on where you are, those are available. So we've covered a lot in this uh, section today. We talked about in the beginning why and how you'd want to go through learning styles. What's your learning style yourself? 
How do you link it to previous knowledge? We did a little review of Bloom's taxonomy and how we step our way up from simple knowledge up to, to the top of synthesis. And then we went through some learning options, instructor-led training and what's good and bad about it, self-study, group study, hands-on studying, online training, and then a little bit about the two types of certifications, the vendor neutral CWMP and the vendor certifications from Cisco and other vendors. That's a, a pretty thorough covering of how to learn and the pieces that are there. I've been at this for a while, and I think as conclusion, let's just talk a little bit about your how you can be a good student. And this good student works in any of the methods that we talked about before. Ask lots of questions. Ask lots and lots of questions. Never move on to the next topic until you thoroughly understand the one you're on. Because it's only going to get harder. More stuff gets added on, and if you don't understand it, how are you going to build on top of that? And so you need to ask lots of questions. Read, study, practice, focus, and ask lots of questions. See a pattern here? You've got to focus, study, read questions, 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 and it's all in that focus. It's your responsibility. You're in charge of your own learning, so take a little control. Find the learning style that works for you. Dedicate your time and energy into study. Use all the resources that are available to you and focus. It's all a matter of focus, and you'll be able to learn wireless LAN technology as well. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of Wireless LAN Weekly. We're glad we can bring these to you on a weekly basis. If you do have any thoughts or ideas of uh, other future shows you'd like to hear or things that other individuals we can interview as well and bring on the show, feel free to do that. There are notes for everything I've covered today in the show notes, and you can get that at uh, wirelesslandprofessionals.com, and this is episode 23. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless land professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire.